Good morning and assalamu alaikum. I, Marwa Sohail from Faculty of Social Sciences, welcome you all along with our guest speaker, Sheikh Imran Nazir Hussain, in today's session of Faculty Professional Development Program 2021. The title of today's talk is The Quran, Absolute Truth in the Art of Critical Thinking. We will start this session with the recitation of Holy Quran. For this, I request Hafiz Irfanullah to come on stage and recite a few verses from Holy Quran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يسبح لله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وما في الأرض الملك القدوس العزيز الحكيم هو الذي بعث في الأميين رسولا منهم يد يتلو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب يزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة وإن كانوا من قبل لفي ضلال مبين وآخرين منهم لما يلحقوا بهم وهو العزيز الحكيم ذلك فضل الله يؤتيه من يشاء والله ذو الفضل العظيم Everything in the heavens and in the earth glorifies Allah, the real King, the most pure of all shortcomings and imperfections the Lord of Honor, the Almighty, the Most Wise. He is the one who sent a glorious messenger, blessings and peace be upon him amongst the illiterate people from amongst themselves, who recites to them his revelations and cleanses and purifies them outwardly and inwardly and teaches them the book and wisdom. Indeed, they were in open error before his most welcome arrival. And he has sent his messenger for purification and education amongst others of them also who have not yet joined these people. And he is almighty, most wise. This arrival of the holy messenger is Allah's bounty which he grants whom he likes, and Allah is most bountiful. Sadaqallahul Azim. Jazakallah. I now request Dean Social and Management Sciences, Dr. Naman Majid, to come for a welcome note. Hauzu billahi min ash rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Honorable Chief Guest, Sheikh Imran Nazar Hussain, distinguished colleagues, the deans of the faculties, directors, head of the departments, 
faculty members, and honorable guests who have accompanied the Sheikh. Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. On behalf of Lahore Garrison University, it is an absolute honor to welcome Sheikh Imran Nazar Hussain, international Islamic scholar and philosopher from Trinidad and Tobago at Lahore Garrison University. I would just like to mention that we were very fortunate that Sheikh Imran Nazar Hussain has also delivered a keynote speech at our International Conference on Management and Social Sciences that was held on 16th of June. His session was appreciated all across the globe. That was on his talk, his keynote talk was on Pakistan, the way forward. We still are receiving emails and messages from all across the globe that Lahore Garrison University, they send their congratulations and they have been asking, uh, how did you manage to invite Sheikh Imran Nazar Hussain? Because of his global commitments, uh, it is very difficult for him uh, to be available for these sessions. So we were fortunate enough, Alhamdulillah, I will just share with you that yesterday uh, in our office, our Associate Dean Management Sciences received a call from an Australian student, a young boy who called from Australia. Uh, we don't know uh, how did he come to know that Sheikh Imran Nazar Hussain is visiting us today. And he said, uh, Madam, uh, is it true that Sheikh Imran Nazar Hussain is visiting Lahore Garrison University? Uh, she replied, yes, Alhamdulillah, he's visiting for a faculty development program session. So uh, he said very uh, innocently that I am one of his uh, fan and follower. Please pay him my regards. And out of uh, extreme joy, he said, uh, Sheikh Imran Nazar Hussain is from Trinidad. Please also request him to pay my regards to Brian Lara from West Indies. So <laughs> that was very innocent uh, of him that he mentioned that also. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today who is going to talk to us at our Faculty Development Program 2021 on the topic of the Quran, Absolute Truth and the Art of Critical Thinking. Sheikh Imran Nazar Hussain doesn't need an introduction, but being faithful to the norms of this August forum and this Faculty Development Program session, I will just share his brief profile. Sheikh Imran Nazar Hussain is an international Islamic scholar, author, and philosopher, specializes in Islamic eschatology, world politics, economics, and modern socio-economic and political issues. Sheikh Imran Nazar Hussain was born in the Caribbean island of Trinidad in 1942 from parents whose ancestors has migrated from India and before that from Khurasan. He has studied at several institutions of higher learning, including the University of West Indies, University of Karachi, Al-Azhar University, and the Graduate Institute of International Relations in Geneva, Switzerland. He has also worked for several years as a Foreign Service Officer in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Government of Trinidad and Tobago, but he gave up his job in 1985 to devote his life to the mission of Islam. He lived in New York for 10 years. During the time, he served as the Director of Islamic Studies for Joint Committee of Muslim Organizations of Greater New York, Director of Islamic Institute for Education and Research in Miami, Florida, and Director of Dawa for tanzim -e islami of North America. This reminds me when Sheikh Imran Nazar Hussain, uh, 20 or 21 years back, he was invited by Dr. Israr Ahmed at a Khilafah conference in Islamabad. Sheikh Imran Nazar Hussain has also lectured on Islam in several American and Canadian universities, colleges, churches, synagogues, prisons, and community halls, etc. He also participated in many interfaith dialogues with Christian priests and Jewish scholars and rabbis while representing Islam in United States of America. 
He was the imam for some time at Masjid Darul Quran in Long Island, New York. He also led the weekly Juma prayers and delivered the sermon at the United Nations headquarters in Manhattan once a month for 10 years continuously. He has traveled extensively around the world on Islamic lecture tours since 1971, so almost half a century. He has devoted his life to the mission of Islam. He has also written more than a dozen of books, almost more than 30 books, and few are in pipeline. And his famous books indeed are Jerusalem in Quran, an Islamic view of the destiny of Jerusalem, the Quran, the Great War and the West, the methodology for study of the Quran, signs of the last day in the modern age, Constantinople in the Quran have become the best sellers and few of the books have been translated and published in several different languages. Ladies and gentlemen, in the interest of time, I would just like uh, to be brief and I am sure you will have a valuable session on the subject of the Quran, absolute truth and the art of critical thinking in which we should all be deeply interested in. Ladies and gentlemen, please Please join me in welcoming Sheikh Imran Nazar Hussain. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all of His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Uh, respected Vice Chancellor, respected uh, uh, deans of different faculties, professors, uh, lecturers, brothers uh, and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It has been <laughs> my dream to go to each university in Pakistan and to speak to to those who are 18 and 19, 20, 21 years of age and to try to get them to fall in love with the Quran. And today, although you are, many of you above 18, uh, my dream comes true. And I thank uh, Professor Noman Majid who acted very quickly. You have an expression in Pakistan, when a dinner is arranged impromptu, you call it Dawat Shirazi. This is Takrida Shirazi. <laughs> uh, I, I was coming to Lahore for one night on my way to Karachi. But then Karachi said, No, you can't come. Lockdown. That's how this structure became possible. The man who should be delivering this lecture. <laughs> Dr. Muhammad Iqbal and in his absence the man who should be delivering this lecture was my teacher of blessed memory Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadl Rahman Ansari Iqbal called for the reconstruction of religious thought in Islam we have an echo here Iqbal called for the reconstruction of religious thought in Islam. And my teacher in his book, The Quranic Foundations and Structure of Muslim Society, in two volumes, began the effort of responding to Iqbal's call for the reconstruction of religious thought. And I have inherited that profile. It is with this that I make the effort to address a subject that they can do, they can address far better than I can do. The Quran has said time and again that it was sent to people who think <laughs> and Iqbal commented that this Ummah has stopped thinking 
I thought it was 500 years, but Colonel Ashwak correct, corrected me. He said, no, no, he said 300 years. And so it's time for a wake-up call to ask our people, and in particular, the Darul Ulum, to start thinking. And we begin by suggesting that there is quite a difference between religious thought and secular thought. Religious thought delivers a different kind of thinking from secular scholarship. When you study the Quran as it ought to be studied, you will learn that modern Western civilization didn't fall out of the sky, it didn't appear on the stage of history by accident. But the modern Western civilization is explained in the Quran. And Allah has delivered a curse on that civilization. A curse to which I can turn to later. But at the heart of the end time or eschatology in the Quran is someone known as the Messiah. And before the Messiah returns, and the return of the Messiah is firmly located in the Quran, there is someone who will appear in the world who will seek to impersonate the Messiah. I'm speaking slowly so it can sink in because the subject is not taught in universities. The Messiah is one who will rule the world with a rule which is eternal, a rule which cannot be rivaled by any any in any single any single state or any combination of states and that he will rule from Jerusalem with justice. And he who is to impersonate the Messiah in order to convince the Jews that he is indeed the Messiah would have to rule the world. Would have to rule the world from Jerusalem. Would have to liberate the Holy Land for the Jews would have to return the Jews to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem, to reclaim it as their own, would have to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land, and would then have to cause that state of Israel to succeed the United States of America to succeed Pax Americana with a Pax Judaica, with Israel ruling the world. Most Pakistanis now understand this, alhamdulillah. It's difficult for the Americans to understand it, but most Pakistanis now understand this. And of course, he's close to achieving that. He's already liberated the Holy Land for the Jews. He's already brought the Jews back to the Holy Land 2,000 years after they were expelled. He's already restored the state of Israel in the Holy Land. And as an Israeli Prime Minister reminded us a few decades ago, we rule the United States. Israel rules the United States. And so Israel is already on its way to become the ruling state in the world. But that's not our subject today. In order to achieve this objective of political dominance, of economic dominance, of monetary dominance, 
the impersonator who we call al masihu dajjal needed a civilization that will change the world and that is the explanation of modern western civilization and secular thinking has come from that civilization in the modern age with this introduction there is a profound difference between religious thinking and secular thought and secular thought has come from modern western civilization the model of religious thought and religious scholarship in akhir zaman is located in someone who has been given the title green sadran that's not his name he's called khidr because he thinks differently his thought is different his knowledge is different it's not a package that is handed down from generation to generation mechanical scholarship no no his scholarship is like rain drops which fall from the sky and brings the dead earth back to life and everything becomes green his scholarship touches the heart excites the heart and brings a new life to you to your thought this is khidr alayhi salam and uh, it is to that kind of thinker and his way of thinking that Iqbal referred you know my Urdu is not too good but I memorized a few uh, verses it is to that kind of thinking and that kind of scholarship that Iqbal referred to when he said bari mushkil se hota hai chaman mein deed aur paida and today we are going to look at the thought and the thinking of the deed aur but Iqbal was himself inspired by Rumi and when you look at the masnavi of Rumi the most the punch line of the whole whole masnavi is Rumi the profound call of Rumi to turn away from barren scholarship unproductive thinking shallow thinking and he calls for basar 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 he repeats it three times basar intuitive internal spiritual insight and so the critical thinker in religious scholarship is not only a deed hour but he also a sahib al basar when will the darul ulum learn that when will we get more than mechanical scholarship from the darul ulum he is one who recognizes that critical thinking is possible only when thought flows from the ocean of truth al haq and the university is the place where the student has to be taken to the ocean of truth and from that ocean he must drink whether it's the department of psychology or sociology or politics or economics or monetary economics it is from that ocean of truth that the that the student must drink the quran declares of itself 
that it is al haqq al yaqeen it is absolute truth they don't like to hear this in washington secular scholarship does not recognize anything as absolute truth but pakistan was not born to become a banda of a people who cannot think a civilization which is incapable of profound thought otherwise how could they have as their crowning achievement that a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate that's the crowning achievement of a modern west that every pakistani want to leave and go and live in the united states when you got the best mangoes in the world right in pakistan if i had the chance i would spend all the rest of my life here in pakistan but it's not possible for me the the quran declares that it is absolute truth and if pakistan is to ever ever recover some integrity as a state it has to begin with the declaration whether washington likes it or not that this country recognizes absolute truth to be located in the quran secular scholarship would never accept that unless the quran is the very foundation of thought and of knowledge one cannot achieve critical thinking as a muslim the quran must not only therefore we recognize as absolute truth but that absolute truth has a function to perform and that is that absolute truth must sit in judgment over everything else outside of it absolute truth must sit in judgment therefore over hadith and so if a hadith declares that our prophet married alayhi salatu wassalam married a child who is six years of age that's what the hadith says that's what bukhari says that was muslim says the sahih hadith that he married a child who is six years of age then is it not the function of the quran to sit in judgment over that and when the quran sits in judgment over that alleged hadith it becomes very quickly clear as daylight even to a schoolboy that this is in conflict with truth in the quran and therefore it's bogus and fabricated and so not only must we as critical thinkers recognize absolute truth in the quran but more than that and this is homework for every faculty in the university that absolute truth must sit in judgment over psychological truth over sociological truth over economic particularly economic truth and when i graduated from pakistani university and from the alimi institute and went back to trinidad at the age of 29 my teacher said to me i want your hand to be like this not like this go get a job and earn your livelihood so i applied for the foreign ministry and they said yes we like to have you in the foreign ministry but you must go back to university they sent me back to university and i spent the most exciting year of my life not in a british and american or a french or a canadian university no it was a it was a university in the caribbean an institute of international relations and i had local people my director was from haiti professor leslie maniga and it was the most exciting year of my life when i came first in the class they sent me to switzerland to do the phd 
and those were the boring years. I had to sit in the classroom of international economics. And you have a professor teaching international economics. And they're all white students, white and brown skinned from the Caribbean. And I challenge him every day in the classroom. Until eventually he called me aside and he said, Mr. Hussein, you don't have to attend my class, you know, you just write the exam at the end of the year. It was an admission of defeat. I was able to punch holes through his economic theory. Why? Because I had the Quran as my guide. And so absolute truth must sit in judgment over what is taught in the economics department, what is taught in the department of monetary economics, which has delivered your bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram paper money. You're Pakistani rupee. You can't find a single mufti in this country who can recognize your money as bogus and fraudulent and haram and as a vehicle of exploitation and impoverishment and enslavement. So that eventually you'll have one Pakistan in which someone is earning 300,000 rupees a month but he pays his uh, the driver and the chowkidar and the cook and the gardener and the nanny and whatever you are the market wage which of course is the market of thieves and so he gets I was astonished when I heard it I couldn't believe it that in Islamabad he's earning 18,000 rupees a month and he says to me, Sheikh, if I were in my village, I'd get only 12,000. That is what your money has done in your banking system. And they don't have a voice with which to speak. So we have to be a voice for them. That this monetary system must be denounced. And that and the valid monetary system which emerges from the Quran must replace it. But you don't have any voices in Pakistan calling for that. Absolute truth does not only have a rational dimension to it for the process of thinking, but in addition to the rational dimension of the process of thinking, there's also a spiritual dimension. I couldn't understand this at the age of 22, when Maulana Fadlur Rahman and Sari were teaching. What does spirituality have to do with rational thought? I couldn't understand it. But there is a rational component in critical thinking and there is also a spiritual component in critical thinking and it's time for the university to recognize that. And Surah Al-Kahf of the Quran which is the Surah par excellence of epistemology. This is epistemology, the branch of knowledge which studies knowledge and studies the process of thinking, epistemology. Surah Al-Kahf of the Quran is the Surah par excellence of epistemology. And it tells us that the rational component of thinking must be harmoniously integrated with the spiritual component. They can't exist as two different islands. You know, you, you, you employ a few people to teach psychology and sociology in the Darul Loom, and you say, we've done it. That's not the way. You have to integrate the 
the rational with the spiritual. Intellectual truth, rational truth is externally derived. But spiritual truth is internally received. It's a gift from above. And the, the Quran in Surah al kaf tells us that the real thinker, the one who is capable of critical thinking, the one who is therefore capable of penetrating the reality of things. That's critical thinking. That is critical thinking. To be able to penetrate beyond external form to reach internal substance. To find such a critical thinker Surah al kaf of the Quran says, you got to go to Majma'ul Bahrain. Majma'ul Bahrain is the place where the two oceans meet. An ocean of knowledge that is externally derived. You got to burn the midnight oil, you got to work. If you don't plant, you cannot reap. That's external knowledge. But then there is also another ocean of knowledge that is internally received. And it is only when these two oceans of knowledge are harmoniously integrated that you can find the critical thinker. If, if, if it were well, yeah. He would explain this much better than I can possibly do. And he wrote the two first chapters of his reconstruction. Difficult chapters to study. As a master's degree student in philosophy at Karachi University about 50 years ago, I had to read those two chapters about 20 times to try to understand Iqbal in his effort to demonstrate the validity of knowledge internally received, in his effort to establish the validity, the credentials of knowledge which is internally received, because the modern West says, no, that's not knowledge. That came from Disneyland, but cannot be admitted as knowledge. Knowledge that is internally received. And so it is at Majma'ul Bahrain that you'll find the real thinker, the critical thinker. This is Surah al kaf of the Quran. And these two oceans must be harmoniously integrated. Nobody in the Darul room understands that up to this day. And so we're not producing scholars anymore. We're producing people who have hand-me-down knowledge. Knowledge that is packaged and is transferred from one generation to another generation uncritically. When Allah has said, I've sent this book to people who think. And so now if we are to be eligible of the capacity to penetrate the internal reality of things. If we are to be eligible to become critical thinkers, not only do we have to learn how to think rationally, but we also have to learn how to receive knowledge internally. And I want to now take you for the, to the first verse of the Quran. And it is in Surah al waqiah And uh, pay careful attention. Allah speaks in Surah al waqiah 
Ba'adawuzu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim And he says Fala uksimu bimawake in nujum And I take an oath I take an oath By the positions In which the stars are located and elsewhere he said that I've given you the stars in the lowest sky as lamps masabi a lamp provides light with light you know which way to go and so the stars are there to provide guidance and with the stars they locate direction and so he takes an oath by the positions in which the stars are located and then he goes on to say this is no ordinary kasam or oath this is the mother of all this is a tremendously important Qasam or Oath وَإِنَّهُ لَقَسَمٌ لَوْ تَعَلَمُونَ عَظِيمٌ What is it? He then goes on to say إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ Quran means recitation Quran means recitation That's what Quran means this is a recitation which is noble and generous with this recitation you can be raised in nobility and this recitation is located in a book which protects it which is protected now listen La yamassuhu illa al-mutahharun None can touch touch it None can touch it except those who are pure and clean This is leading us now to the morality of critical thinking We come to it in a moment None can touch it. Touch what? Touch the Quran or touch the Kitab which protects it? Touch what? Obviously, none can touch this Quran. None can touch this Quran. But the Quran is a recitation. A recitation is located in the world of sound. So how can you touch something that is located in the world of sound? We have the physics department here. <laughs> you can't touch something that is located in the world of sound. So this is not to be understood literally. This is ayamutashabiha. It has to be interpreted. None can touch this Qur'an other than those who are clean and pure implies you cannot penetrate you cannot, you cannot even scratch this Qur'an to penetrate its meaning to study it unless you fulfill the moral requirement you must be clean and pure and every professor must try to explain this to the young ones that that which will contaminate you that which will destroy your purity that which will destroy whatever fragrance you have in you and from you will emerge only badbu is zina and today we live in a world uh, in my country in Trinidad we have carnival and women are dancing naked on the streets 
in Trinidad, naked with body paint. And that, of course, is called progress. <laughs> the modern feminist revolution refers to this as progress. So when you live in a world in which sex is as freely available as sunshine, eventually you're, lead, you're being led to zina. And if you enter into the door of zina, of illicit sexual relations, your khushbu will go and it will be replaced with badbu. You will not be ever able to even scratch truth to be able to penetrate. You'll never be a thinker. You have a status equivalent to the sheep and the cattle and the goats and the camels. And sheep should marry with sheep. And the pure should be reserved for the pure. Not only must you warn them about this great danger in this modern age of Zina, but also Reba. That if you are paying your servant the salary of a slave, that's what Singapore does, the model state of Singapore. They import millions of my daughters from Indonesia, millions of them. And they pay them the wage of a slave. That's what the government of Singapore has, has negotiated with the government of Indonesia. And these girls work and work and work and work for a wage that no Singaporean woman would ever accept. If you pay an unjust wage, you are living off the sweat of those who are so exploited. You're drinking their blood. And there is zero tolerance for oppression, particularly economic oppression, in truth. And so now back to Surah Tulwakia. Now that we have directed some attention to the moral prerequisites for critical thinking, the moral prerequisites for critical thinking. For the Oximu no Jum, and I take an oath by the positions in which the stars are located. And this is no ordinary oath. This is the mother of all oaths. What is Allah speaking about? Where he goes on to then say, this is the Quran that is noble and generous. Answer. That if you want to study the Quran, you cannot do it. By studying, you know, Surah Al-Fatiha first, and then Surah Al-Baqarah, and then Surah to Ali Imran. Not even a schoolboy should do that. <laughs> Allah never divided the Quran into surahs for study. No, no, no. He says so in the Quran. You must read my book, The Quran in the Moon. He says, I have divided the Quran into surahs, not for study, but for recitation. And that is why you now have to ask the question, well, why did he put the longest surah of all at the beginning? And all the long ones at the beginning. And at the end, he gives us very, very short so I'm not going to tell you the answer. You, that's your homework. But the Quran is divided into surahs for recitation, not for study. Well, then how do you study the Quran? You study the Quran the way you read the stars. Who does, who, who, which, which pilot who has to navigate a ship would look at one star, and with only one star, he's able to locate direction. No. You have to look at all, all the stars. You have to study all the stars. You have to study how they are interconnected with each other. You have to locate patterns in the sky. 
in order to be able to navigate with the stars. And truth is like that. Critical thinking is like that. And the verses of the Quran are like that. I want to give a few examples and I'll end. I have introduced you to the subject of critical thinking from the Quran. Allah speaks at the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah and He invites you to think. He says, I gave an order to the angels to prostrate, to make sajda before Adam alayhi salam. Fasajadu illa Iblis. And they all prostrated except Iblis. And so the rational thinker, the logical thinker who uses the wrong methodology, he says, like I did when I was 17, <laughs> and I came, to, I came to the conclusion, since the order was given to the angels, and since they all obeyed, except him, Iblis had to be an angel. I came to this conclusion when I was 17, I remember. Iblis has to be an angel. This is wrong methodology. To look at only one star, to look at only one verse of the Quran, to look at only one hadith. And I've done my job. I've studied the subject. Gog and Magog will not be released until Nabi Isa Islam returns and he's killed the child. And between the, mo the time of Dajjal being killed and, and Gog and Magog being destroyed, probably only two, three, four weeks, so Gog and Magog will be, will be released at that time and they will live for about three, four weeks. That's modern Islamic scholarship. That pathetic scholarship. But when you go to the rest of the Quran, when you study the verses of the Qur'an as they ought to be studied, critically, the critical thinker, you learn to your surprise that angels don't have a free will. Don't, angels don't have the capacity for choice. They have to do whatever they are ordered to do. They have no choice. So if Allah gave an order to the angels to submit to make sajda, they had no choice. They had to submit. But he had a choice. So he couldn't be an angel. That's critical thinking. And then Allah went on and <laughs> Surah so Al-Kaf to say, what can I mean, Al-Jinn? Why did he construct the Quran like this? Why did he open the Quran with this statement? I ordered the angels to make sajda and they all did accept him. Answer, that Allah is teaching us a lesson in critical thinking. That's why. And he starts at the beginning of the Quran. Let me give you a second example. And this one with more profound implications. And uh, when you go back home, I suggest you look up, the, you look up all the tafsir of the Quran you can find and all the translations. I have the opinion that the miraculous word of Allah cannot be translated. So I never translate the Qur'an. Rather, I offer an explanation of the Qur'an, not a translation. So here is a verse of Surah Al-Ma'idah. And this is what Allah says. 
Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu O you who have faith In this Quran La tattakhizu al-yahuda Man nasara awliya Do not take Jews Do not take the Jews And do not take the Christians As your friends And allies Ba'aduhum mawliya ubad The explanation that is offered by modern Islamic scholarship is they are friends and allies of each other. The Jews and the Christians, they are friends and allies of each other, which is absolutely false. There is no question about it, this is false. Jews and Christians were never, never, never friends and allies of each other. They were not friends and allies at the time when the Qur'an was revealed. And they were never friends and allies for more than a thousand years after that. So how can you say they are friends and allies of each other? That's false. And yet, that's what you'll find in every tafsir, every tarjuma of the Qur'an you pick up. Do your homework and check it out. وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُمْ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ مِنْهُمْ And whosoever from amongst you turn to them with friendship and alliance. You belong to them. You no longer belong to the Ummah of Muhammad إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ And Allah does not provide guidance for a wicked people. So what is the Qur'an saying? The critical thinker will not take a verse or a part of a verse in isolation. Critical thinking requires you to go to the entire canvas, study all the verses pertaining to the subject, all the stars, and locate the pattern which brings them all together into a harmonious whole. That is critical thinking. So you would not examine the virus and the vaccine by itself, would you? By itself, without seeking to locate how it's connected with other things, okay? If they don't want to think critically, well, let them be. But you are now critical thinkers. And so what is the Quran saying? If I, if the Quran tells me I can marry a Christian girl, yes, I can marry her, I have permission. And if I'm not allowed to be friends and allies with Christians and Jews, I'll have to say to her, uh, to my wife, uh, uh, Jani, you know, you can be my wife, but you can't be my friend. <laughs> Lahore doesn't smile, do you? <laughs> Jan Mary Begum Ban Sakti hai, Lakin Dosne Ban Sakti hai. What a load of rubbish. You can be my wife, but you can't be my friend, so obviously there's something wrong with this. Or your Christian or your Jewish neighbor comes and you invite him to eat or he invites you to eat and the Quran says his food is halal for you your food is halal for him so after the meal you say to him Rabbi thank you for this lovely dinner I enjoyed being sitting with you and having a nice dinner but Rabbi you can't be my friend you know I can eat with you but you can't be my friend <laughs> At least some people in Lahore can smile. So now, it's ridiculous. This explanation of the verse of the Quran that we now have in nearly every copy of the Quran you find doesn't make sense. Critical thinking is required. And when we do that, we find 
that while there are some Christians with whom we are prohibited from being friends and allies, there are other Christians who are not like that. And Allah has said that they will one day become dearest in love and affection for you. That there will be a Christian people who will one day become closest in love and affection for you. Love and affection. And you can't be friends with them. <laughs> when will that come? Of course, you know. It's when after the Great War, which is coming, there is a conquest of Constantinople by a Muslim army. You know that. I have a book entitled Constantinople in the Quran. And then after the conquest of Constantinople, we will then return Hagia Sophia to those to whom it rightfully belongs. Let me repeat that. We will return Hagia Sophia to those to whom it rightfully belongs. I have been in Pakistan now for four months. Not one person, not one in Pakistan has challenged me on the subject. If they differ with me, they prefer to be silent than to challenge me. And when we return Hagia Sophia, in accordance with truth in the Quran, when we return Hagia Sophia, the cathedral, to the Orthodox Christian world, their hearts will melt. The church bells of Greece would ring and ring and ring and ring with joy, more than the Russians. And that will provoke that orthodox Christian well to become closest in love and affection for this Ummah. So the Quran could not be speaking of all Jews and all Christians when it says don't take the Jews and don't take the Christians as your friends and allies. The first fruit of critical thinking is that this verse is not addressing all Jews and all Christians. Well then, which Jews and which Christians? And the answer comes in the words which follow. Don't take Jews and Christians as your friends and allies who are, who are themselves, who are themselves, friends and allies of each other. The Quran is telling us that a day will come when part of the Christian world and part of the Jewish world will reconcile and form friendship and alliance and that's your Zionist Judeo-Christian alliance which has given us the United Nations Organization, which has given us the International Monetary Fund, and so many other things. Don't take them as your friends and allies. Not all Christians and all Jews. And whosoever turns to them to become a member state of NATO. And you say you're Muslim? And you are a member state of NATO? You belong to them. You do not belong to this Ummah and Allah does not provide guidance for wicked people. I have given you these two examples. I wish I had more time to go to other verses of the Quran to show how with critical thinking you can penetrate truth. And there are millions of pearls located in the Quran, millions of them, waiting for the critical thinker. And we pray that Allah might bless our efforts in the universities of Pakistan to plant the seeds 
that tomorrow we might have a new generation of critical thinkers. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Sheikh Imran Nazar Hussain Sahib. And ladies and gentlemen of the faculty, this uh, was the last event of your uh, faculty development program. And let me say what a befitting ending. Uh, on my own behalf and on behalf of each one of you, I sincerely and profusely thank you, sir, for such an enlightening talk. And I'm sorry that uh, uh, more questions couldn't be permitted because you also have a busy schedule and we also have uh, things to do. But inshallah, uh, hopefully, when you are next time in Pakistan, we would like to give you a larger audience and perhaps include uh, some of our students who would also be having doubts. Uh, and not only on the subject of the Quran uh, and the art of critical thinking, but we would like to be enlightened by you on other subjects which you no doubt are an expert on. So my profound thanks to you, sir, and we will, inshallah, be looking forward to you coming back to Lahore Garrison University. Uh, and may God give you long life and you continue to come here and enlighten the students. And perhaps, as you yourself said, uh, we may be able to create that generation of scholars. So thank you very much once again. Uh, may I request you to all please join me in thanking uh, Sheikh Sab.